Does anyone honestly expect us to believe that Joseph Smith, an unlearned young man of 23 years of age, searched out and studied all these resources on Native American life, inhaled the related conversations on this topic, ferried out the irrelevant, organized the remainder into an intricate story involving hundreds of characters, numerous locations, detailed war strategies, doctrinal gems, and then dictated with perfect recollection without any notes whatsoever, no outline, no manuscript, nothing, a fact acknowledged even among Joseph's critics. Mormonism with the Murph, where Larry Singh explores church history and the church's truth claims. Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. So in the last episode, we had a look at could Joseph Smith have naturally created the Book of Mormon himself? We looked at the time frame for the 588 pages that he dictated in around 57 to 74 working days without any notes, book or manuscript to work from according to eyewitness testimony and also without any substantial revisions. We discussed some of the complex elements of the Book of Mormon, such as the internal consistent geography, currency systems, uh, the different records and record keepers, the genealogy of the Jaredite kings, listing 40 kings, talking about each one in reverse order. We also talked about some ancient elements in the Book of Mormon, such as Asherah and the Tree of Life, prophetic lawsuits, ancient covenant renewals, Hebrew literary elements like Hebraisms and Chiasmus, and Joseph's education level as well, and also how well he might have known the Bible. Uh, so go back and watch that one if you haven't to find out more. And overall, just the difficulty of doing an oral creative dictation without any notes or manuscript. So this is going to be sort of piggybacking and continuing on from the last episode. We're going to be looking at the naturalistic explanations for the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. We're going to be presenting some of the critical theories that there's been since the Book of Mormon was dictated and some apologetic responses. And this will probably be another long video, so bear with me. So early critics of the Book of Mormon, such as Mark Twain, said that Joseph plagiarized from the Bible and New Testament and that he created an imagined history with the Old Testament as a model. Critics such as Alexander Campbell believed Joseph was the author and that he was an ignorant man and clearly the author and that the book is beneath contempt. And a popular theory which originated in 1834 in Mormonism Unveiled was the Solomon Spalding Manuscript. Brian Hales in a Fair Mormon conference addresses this and also check out my part two episode with Brian Hales where we talk about sort of these authorship theories lay for the Book of Mormon. I'll put the link where you can watch it. So people are saying that Spalding shared his manuscript with them in 1812 and it resembles the Book of Mormon and is the most predominant theory in the 1800s until 1884 until they find a copy of the manuscript and it bears no resemblance or really any strong connections to the Book of Mormon. And also the length is 50,840 words compared to the Book of Mormon, which is just under 270,000 words. Hills goes on to say that the overall writing style and composition are vastly different. There's no identical or similar names of people and places, and there's just no documentation that Sidney Rigdon had ever met Spalding or was aware of his manuscript. And there's also the problem with any theory that says that Joseph had a pre-existing manuscript. How did he get that into the translation process? We have friendly and unfriendly people telling us Joseph put his head in a hat and dictated. There were no other manuscripts around. And so if he had a manuscript, did he memorize it the night before? Did he sneak it into the hat? I mean, it's a problem that is not just for this particular theory. Also, John A. Widstow has to say that the discovered Spalding story has since been published in two editions and it bears no resemblance in language style, names or subject matter to the Book of Mormon. And even prominent critics like Dan Vogel and the Tanners would reject Solomon Spalding manuscript being a source for the Book of Mormon. Also briefly touching on this is also the collaboration theory. Few critics state that this was how it was done, as it would be more risky, having multiple co-conspirators with Joseph, who easily could have exposed the fraud later. And it's always just more risky having more people in on the con. It was believed Sidney Rigdon helped write the Book of Mormon and took the Sol Solomon Spalding manuscript. And some people even claim that they saw him around New York. You'll find those in some of the Hurlbert affidavits, which there's just no evidence that uh, Rigdon met Joseph during that time. Uh, he was converted after the Book of Mormon was created. Rigdon didn't meet Joseph until after the Book of Mormon was published and was converted by it. Heels goes on to say the reasons why the co collaborator theory is not more widely accepted is that the supportive arguments are primarily speculative. There just isn't any credible corroborative, any credible corroborative historical documentation. And then you've got to ask the question, particularly if Sidney Rigdon were involved or someone, why would anyone put in all that work without eventually demanding some of the credit? 
So the collaborator theory is out there, but it's never been that popular. Okay, and let's also talk about then Ethan Smith and the view of the Hebrews. We did do a separate video on that, the view of the Hebrews and the mind builder myth. Uh, so go back and watch that if you want to go more in depth. Uh, but this is what Brian Hales has to say. So this was a book written by Ethan Smith in 1823, and it's really to show how the Native Americans were the lost 10 tribes of Israel. That's really what his book was about, essentially. And the critics loved to hammer the fact that he was from the same town that Oliver Cowdery was from, and that he was a pastor in Cowdery's church. And also, some people have speculated that if Ethan Smith was Oliver Cowdery's minister and his family attended his church, then Oliver Cowdery might have been the one to have brought view of the Hebrews to Joseph Smith for the Book of Mormon creation giving him those ideas. However, I see this as highly improbable for two reasons. One, Oliver could have exposed the fraud after he left and was excommunicated from the church, if he was in on the con. And two, Joseph had already begun creating and dictating the 116 pages. Joseph had already begun dictating the Book of Mormon before Oliver Cowdery came in on the scene. So if you believe Joseph Smith is the author, still Joe Smith would have had the narrative and the story mapped out in his head. So you don't need Oliver to have brought the view of the Hebrews to Joseph Smith. But rather than Joe Smith plagiarizing from Solomon Spalding, critics point out the parallels and thematic similarities which Joseph could have borrowed from, from Ethan Smith's view of the Hebrews. However, many of these parallels aren't as strong as presented, and it doesn't account for dissimilarities, and even the parallels shown aren't as strong. Ethan Smith tried to show things of ties with the Hebrews, essentially of Native Americans, that Joseph didn't use at all. And all of these have been shown to actually have been false, but Joseph didn't use any of them. And those were unique things that Joseph didn't use. Todd Callister, in his book, he shared this in The View of the Hebrews. There's a simple test to determine if the Book of Mormon was copied from or relied heavily upon The View of the Hebrews. Simply compare the two books and decide for yourself. Unibly, however, exposed the fallacy of the argument that if two books have parallel themes, one must have been used to create the other. He found 35 parallels between the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Book of Mormon. In fact, he referred to them as perfectly staggering parallels. Nonetheless, the Book of Mormon could not have been plagiarized from or influenced by the Dead Sea Scrolls because they are not discovered until more than a century after the Book of Mormon was published. There is no proven connection of any reliance by one upon the other. In fact, shortly before his death, B.H. Roberts declared Ethan Smith, the man who wrote View the Hebrews, played no part in the formation of the Book of Mormon. Joseph even referred to the View of the Hebrews in the 1842 Times and Seasons. You would think seems strange and kind of risky if that was the book that he plagiarized from and borrowed either ideas or themes for the Book of Mormon. If Joseph copied from or relied upon View the Hebrews, why would he publicly call attention to it? And then why did none of the early critics of the Book of Mormon mention Ethan Smith and their attacks on it? If the parallels are so evident, why weren't they noticed by individuals who were not only acquainted with Ethan Smith's book, but were also essentially interested in its claims? Why wasn't it prominently mentioned as a source of the Book of Mormon until the beginning of the 20th century, when the book itself had only an antiquarian interest and its contents were no longer so widely a part of popular discussion. And check out the video again that I did on the Mind Builder myth and the view of the Hebrews where I go a little bit more in depth looking at the parallel themes between the view of the Hebrews and the Book of Mormon and also some of the dissimilarities. And I personally think that rather than view of the Hebrews being a source or being themes that Joseph Smith was borrowing from, I think probably a better critical argument is that both books came from the Mind Builder myth that the Native Americans or American Indians, that they descended from Israel and that there was a white skin and a dark skin race and they attributed all these mounds to a more civilized white skin race. And I think you could say that both books uh, could have came out of this milieu if you're coming from, from a naturalistic explanation. Okay, so let's talk about automatic writing. And this has been kind of a new theory that we've learned about over the past year. The term automatic writing is used to designate writing that is done without the writer being conscious of what he is writing. Usually the writing proceeds rapidly, sometimes far more so than the subject's normal writing does. Lawrence Foster wrote, the Book of Mormon is probably best understood, at least in part, as a trance-related production. For some automatic writing advocates, the seer stone or Urim and Thummim was a key component. T.B.H. Stenhouse wrote, Joseph Smith gazed upon that Urim and Thummim until his mind became psychologized and the impressions that he received he dictated to his scribe. The term automatic writing is used to describe two potentially different phenomena, 
one of which is supernatural and the other natural. For hundreds of years, automatic writers have applied the term to spontaneous writing they attributed to supernatural sources. Brian Hales recorded over a dozen books created by automatic writing or dictation, claiming to produce the text by a divine or supernatural force. Most comparable to the Book of Mormon is the text by Pearl Curran, called The Sorry Tale in 1917. It is 264,000 words, about 6,000 shy of the Book of Mormon, similar in length, and it was communicated by the spirit of a deceased woman, Patience Worth. It came through a Ouija board. Although Pearl Curran eventually got rid of the Ouija board, she says she didn't need it anymore. And that's similar to Joe Smith with his seer stone that he didn't need it anymore in obtaining revelations. If we compare the Book of Mormon and Joseph Smith to Pearl Curran, the sorry tale, there are a number of undeniable similarities. The authors had minimal education. There is no pre-writing, no rewriting. There is just dictation. The word counts are similar. There is similar complexity. But Brian Heels say that he thinks the book more is a little bit more complex. The dictation sessions were a similar length. They would start where they previously ended the dictation. They didn't go back and review or anything to start again. There was no editing. It went straight to the printer. And both used an instrument, Joseph the Searstone and Pearl, Pearl Curran use the Ouija board. So does automatic writing, does that show this is how Joseph Smith created the Book of Mormon naturalistically? Well, it does show that Joseph isn't the only one to produce a text uh, by means of this method, by looking at a physical object and it just flowing out. And that there are a number of other people who claim to creatively orally dictated text by supernatural means. But do these supernatural claims of automatic writing explain the Book of Mormon naturally? Brian Hales has to say, a second problem with the automatic writing theory is that explaining an alleged supernatural activity with another alleged supernatural activity does not result in a naturalistic explanation. And we see critics will sometimes refer to the sorry tale of Pearl Curran and say, see, I've explained how Joseph did it. Well, not really. What they need is a naturalistic explanation for one of the processes, and then maybe they could apply it to both. Now, somebody who is a naturalist could then say, well, I don't believe that any of these other automatic writers were doing it by supernatural means. I believe they're doing it naturally. And therefore, Joseph Smith could have done it naturally as well, and that it's a similar phenomena, uh, particularly to Pearl Curran. However, one can't determine if these other automatic writers uh, did it supernaturally or naturally. They claimed it was by supernatural means. And assuming that they did by whatever spur they attribute it to or supernatural element, it doesn't undermine or invalidate or disprove Joseph Smith's claim that he did it supernaturally by the gift and power of God. And that one must provide a naturalistic explanation for all automatic writing. Brian Heels in his article said that critics refer to Joseph as a sponge, a creative religious genius, taking from the King James Bible, view the Hebrews, pulling things from his environment and milieu, and that critics tend to focus on the input or the influences or potential sources, but not so much on how Joseph actually did it. How was he able to creatively orally dictate this in around 65 days? So we're going to discuss what are, in my opinion, probably some of the best, the most well thought out naturalistic explanations for how Joseph Smith created and dictated the Book of Mormon. And we're going to be looking at Grant Palmer, who is the author of An Insider's View of Mormon Origins, former CS director. Dan Vogel, who is the preeminent scholar and historian of Joseph Smith. His biography, Joseph Smith, Making of a Prophet. William Davis, who wrote the book uh, Visions in the Seer Stone. Also check out my interview with Dan Vogel. Uh, also Anthony Miller, who had sort of a good uh, naturalistic theory as well for the composition of the Book of Mormon, uh, you know, borrowing elements from Davis and probably Dan Vogel's theory. And also LDS Discussions has an episode how Joe Smith could have composed the Book of Mormon. And these, in my view, are probably some of the better, more well thought out naturalistic explanations. So we're going to go through each of them. And then we're going to look at maybe some apologetic responses. Unfortunately, I won't be able to talk about each one in a lot of depth just because this is I'm trying to squeeze it into a video. So obviously go check out their books if you want to dive in more. LDS Discussions says that Joseph Smith's mother, Lucy Mack Smith, recalls that Joseph Smith's stories about the Book of Mormon people before he even claimed to have the plates. LES Discussion says that Joseph Smith's mother, Lucy Mack Smith, recalls that Joseph Smith would tell stories about the Book of Mormon people before he even claimed to have the plates. Joseph is telling stories of the former inhabitants of the continent, and that this is him perhaps practicing or rehearsing those stories. Already working on the story, 
down to the details of their clothes, mode of warfare, and even the animals they rode. B.H. Roberts says in light of this evidence, there could be no doubt as to the possession of a vividly strong creative imagination by Joseph Smith. However, the fair response that critics use Lucy's statement to show Joseph was telling these stories, which later became the Book of Mormon. But Joseph Smith told his stories after he learned about and saw the golden plates when visited by Moroni. Indeed, it is known that Moroni showed Joseph visions and gave him information regarding the people whose stories were found on the Nephite record. In Joseph Smith's own official history, he confirmed that he learned this information through the power of visions. Now, when it comes down to this, I think obviously there's two interpretations one could draw. If you don't believe that there is an angel and gold plates and that Joseph Smith is the author and he made it up, then you could interpret this that in 1823, when Joseph Smith is first creating the angel or guardian spirit in the gold plate story that this is him practicing telling stories to his family members so that's one interpretation but lucy isn't saying in her account that that's what joseph is doing he's telling made up stories but that he's retelling to the family members his encounters his visitations and the visions he's having with moroni and the people that he's seeing the ancient inhabitants of the continent so you could also interpret it in a faithful way that this is joseph smith relating his visions which she has had when Moroni came to visit him. Okay, so let's look at the specific theories for the creation and sources that might have been used for the creation of the Book of Mormon. So Grant Palmer, in his book, An Insider's View of Mormon Origin, has different sources or influences that make up a good portion of the Book of Mormon. And I've taken this from Mormon Think. That a lot of first and second Nephi is made up by Joseph Smith's family autobiographical material, such as such as his father's dream, resembling Lehi's dream, which we talked about in a previous episode. Biblical passages dominate the text in these two books, and half of the chapters in 2 Nephi are from the Bible, or the Isaiah chapters. Jacob, Enos, Mosiah, Alma 1-42 is evangelical Methodist camp meeting rhetoric and conversion experiences, and that Methodist ministers uh, mirror the 11 preachers outlined in this part of the Book of Mormon. Alma 43-63, to that these are the war chapters, mirror the strategies of the American Indians in the War of 1812 particularly the British Indian fighting strategies used against American soldiers in the War of 1812. I don't remember reading about this uh, in his book. We did cover about the late war, and we looked at some of the similarities between the war chapters and the late war. Helaman and 3rd Nephi 1-7 is about the Gadianton and robbers, and this is coming from the anti-Masonic rhetoric in Joseph's day. And also Dan Vogel would point to this as being a source or an influence for uh, the Gadiantans in the Book of Mormon. Check out the episode I've done on anti-masonry in the Book of Mormon, and also my interview with Dan Vogel, where we talk a little bit more about that. 3 Nephi 11 to 28, so Bible passages again dominate this section of the Book of Mormon, specifically the King James Version, including translation errors of the 490 verses in these chapters, 246 or roughly half, contain recognizable KJV quotations or phrases. And this is Grant Palmer's sort of theory. This one's more speculative that the Book of Ether reads like Joseph Smith's essay on the central message of the Book of Mormon. The first half of Ether describes what happens to the Jaredites when they follow Christ, while the second half outlines the consequences when they don't. Ether is a synopsis of the Book of Mormon, including the annihilation of both the Jaredites and the Nephites. Similarly to Palmer uh, Vogel, who I did an interview with, uh, he has the book, Joseph Smith, The Making of a Prophet, and we talked about four main sources. Uh, we talked about the King James Bible, uh, the mind builder myth. We talked about uh, Methodist Protestant sermons and anti-Masonic rhetoric. And he would also agree with Palmer about Joe Smith's autobiographical material that he borrowed from his own father's dream for Lehi's dream in the Book of Mormon. Vogel argues in the biography that Joseph Smith was a pious fraud, that Smith essentially invented his religious claims for what he believed were noble faith-promoting purposes. So he invented a fictional narrative of characters and his own set of metal plates but he very much believed in the doctrine and the theology that was contained in the book and was trying to convert people using this complex biblical sounding narrative. Vogel identifies the roots of the pious fraud in the conflict between members of the Smith family who were divided between the skepticism and universalism of Joseph Smith Sr. and the more mainstream Protestant faith of Lucy Mack Smith. Vogel argues that the content of the book comes from Joseph's milieu, environment, experience, and imagination. So let's look at an apologetics response. Uh, James B. Allen did a response to Grant Palmer's book. Read the whole thing, but a few wee synopsis when it comes to the Book of Mormon section. Here's a few quotes. Uh, he talks about that Palmer often doesn't engage with the faithful scholarship, especially on the King James Bible, that Palmer assumes Joseph had been plotting or preparing the story for many years, 
since the angel's first supposed visitation in 1823, that he ignores the many complex or ancient forms scholars have found, uh, which I discussed in the last episode, so go back and watch that one. How Joseph could translate the meaning of the plates into the KJV language, rendering the meaning of the plates, and that it was natural for Joseph to translate into the King James Bible language of the day, as well as using revivalist Methodist language. And my interviews with Navin Lucas, as well as Brent Gardner, uh, discussed that the Book Mormon translation is probably best understood as more of a functional translation, Joe Smith rendering the translation uh, in his language and his vocabulary, and also to make it readable to his 19th century audience, and that the King James Bible passages or revivalist sounding either sermons or phrases isn't necessarily showing that this is just 19th century text, but Joseph may be rendering the meaning in his own language and vocabulary, in, in the language and vernacular of the day. Vogel has been criticized for his naturalistic assumptions of the Book of Mormon, that it isn't history, and that a lot of his book overlaps with Palmer's. And a lot of Dan Vogel's book uh, overlaps with Grant Palmer as well, so I won't recite that. Uh, but some of the criticisms are with regards to certain parallels he makes between the content or plot lines of the Book of Mormon and Joseph Smith's life, such as the rivalry between Nephi and his older brother, Laman and Lemuel, representing a rivalry between Smith and his brothers. However, he states that neither Joseph nor his mother spoke of this rivalry, and the description of sibling rivalry as a theme in the Book of Mormon makes the possibility of such a rivalry impossible to ignore. The incident in which Nephi breaks his steel bow and subsequently successful, successfully locates food is stated to be a fantasy that Smith might have had in his own thoughts. The abduction of the Lamanite daughters by the wicked priests of King Noah is said to represent Smith's elopement with his wife Emma. Abinadi's absence from King Noah's domain for two years is said to represent Smith's absence from Harmony, Pennsylvania. Jacob's criticism of the Nephites for having multiple wives is said to represent Smith criticizing his father, whom the author speculates was unfaithful, and Amalekiah's poisoning of Lahontai in order to become the king of the Lamanites is suggested to represent the death of Smith's older brother Alvin, whom the author speculates died of poisoning. Grant Hardy also says that his book fails to take into account for the sheer complexity of the book and not taking the book's content and figures seriously. In my view, some of the parallels that he pointed to whenever I read through his book, I really find them highly speculative or quite weak parallels. I, I wasn't persuaded by them. And often apologists get criticized for engaging in parallelomania, but I definitely saw that going on, uh, trying to parallel or show that some of these storylines in the book Warren came from things in Joe Smith's life. And I just didn't really see the connections. However, that's not to say I think there are some good arguments for the autobiographical material, Joe Smith Sr.'s dream, the King James Bible, anti-Masonic rhetoric, the Mount Builder myth, the Hebrews and Protestant sounding preaching and theology as being sources or influences for the Book of Mormon. And other places like, you know, Mormon Think or LDS discussions would tend to hone in on those as the main sources or influences. And I've obviously talked about each one in separate videos, and I'll be doing more of my analysis in the final video of the series. And also in my interview with Dan Vogel, his theory for the actual mechanics of the dictation was very similar to William Davis's theory that Joseph Smith was studying it out in his mind. He was reading his Bible, taking breaks between the dictation, and that he didn't have it memorized, a manuscript that he had memorized, but he probably had an outline notes perhaps, or at least a mental note or an outline in his head. So it was a semi-extemporaneous oral dictation. And Davis, in my view, provides the best naturalistic explanation for how he could have actually done the oral dictation. Davis's view is that in 1829, Joseph Smith Jr., the future prophet and founder of the Latter-day Saint movement, produced the Book of Mormon in an extended oral performance, having a rough or skeleton outline prior to each book or like the next part of the narrative. So sometimes there's multiple ones in a book, like the Book of Alma. This outline is used to open the discussion of the technique of laying down heads. He notes the explicit use of the skeletal sketch in the opening of the history, marking each stage in the sequence of the narrative with a summarizing phrase, provides one of the several expressions of the method commonly known as laying down heads. As Davis points out, they often provide an outline of the major events to be discussed of the major events to be discussed in the book which follows. The oral speech act is reliant upon preparation, and this is crucial to his thesis of how the elements of an extemporaneous performance could undergird the oral creation of the Book of Mormon. Understanding that Joseph would have been familiar with laying down heads provides the best explanation for an otherwise ambiguous sentence in the book of Jacob. 
and if there were preaching which was sacred, or revelation which was great, were prophesying that I should engraven the heads of them upon these plates, and touch upon them as it were possible for Christ's sake, for the sake of our people. And Davis also states that Joe Smith used this laying down heads technique, which Methodist ministers in his day would have used in his 1832 history, which he wrote, and also in the King Follett Discourse. The thrust of Davis' argument is that examining sermons outside the Book of Mormon confirms the probability that Joseph Smith used the techniques of preparing an outline before speaking. Davis thus posits that it becomes a reasonable assumption that those techniques were employed in the creation of the Book of Mormon. So in a nutshell, it wasn't memorized word for word, and it also wasn't him just making up on the fly, that he had a rough outline mapped out in his head and similar to a Methodist preacher laying down heads or almost like bullet points of what is going to happen in the story that he would do that at the beginning of each book. You see it at the beginning of First Nephi, there's a big paragraph of what's going to happen in the story. So more of a semi-extemporaneous oral dictation and he's arguing that this is a practice that Joseph would have seen by preachers in his environment. However, the explicit heads completely ignore the sermons and therefore do not provide mnemonic structure that would allow Joseph Smith to create them in an appropriate context. Just the majority of 2 Nephi cannot be explained by laying down heads. The presence of the sermons cannot be explained by laying down heads. So he's saying that the, the laying down heads in the Book of Mormon, the outline, is only really for the story elements, but it, it, there's no laying down heads for any of the sermons in the Book of Mormon. And also that you can't say that the outlines in the Book of Mormon is a purely 19th century element, because it's indistinguishable from written authors foreshadowing what will be on the text. Gardner also says that there is an explicit case of laying down heads in the text. And if we read the long genealogy in Ether 1, 6-32 as laying down heads, that genealogy is used in reverse to structure the historical narrative. That certainly seems like the use of heads, but it requires a prodigious amount of memorization, particularly since the list itself has duplicated names that have to appear correctly in the reverse narrative. Of course, you can maybe say, like Vogel said, that just no matter how to peek at the manuscript. But again, there's no evidence to support that. Brown's conclusion is that constant interruption of thought would make it difficult to produce anything close to what I might do in a strictly oral performance. So obviously, he would have to stop when the scribe would write it down and then read it back to him. So it wouldn't actually be a continual flow. When that problem is combined with the statements from witnesses that Joe Smith always picked up where he left off, without any hint of where he was, then that production process would be beyond anything I have experienced. The greater the need for memorization, the less presence of extemporaneous production we find. The greater the need for memorization, the less presence of extemporaneous production we find. The best use of Davis's hypothesis is to suggest that there was a pre-existing text, because if he's doing it extemporaneously, then it's just happening in the moment. But Gardner is arguing that much of the Book of Mormon narrative would have been really putting a lot of burden on Joseph Smith's memory, and that the actual sentences themselves, and perhaps a few of the asides, were extemporaneous. While the technique of laying down heads was common in the 18th century, pedagogical approaches guiding students in a stopwise fashion from beginning compositional skills to advanced techniques were not yet prevalent. And the obvious conclusion is that the concept of organizing a text is quite ancient. He says Davis is correct that there must have been a pre-existing text, whether written or simply mentally conceived and stored. The data go further to require extensive memorization of massive details that are foreshadowed in the text, but which are not present in the sketch outlines and other mnemonic cues. An example of that was in the last episode where we talked about Alma, who was quoting Lehi, uh, and his vision verbatim in Alma, but that was dictated before First Nephi, and there would have been no laying down head cue for Joseph to remember that. The support for Davis's thesis is the careful selection of only the evidence that supports the hypothesis, while ignoring the vast majority of the Book of Mormon, that cannot be explained by those sketch outlines. Because if you go and look at the books after First Nephi, the sketch outlines are considerably smaller, and they don't account for all of the sermons or all of the complex elements of the narrative. Okay, so moving away from naturalistic explanations or theories for how Joseph Smith could have orally dictated it, and I'm going to give my final analysis in the final video. In the final video, um, but I'm going to read some final quotes about just Joseph Smith's creative skills he would have needed to produce the Book of Mormon 
and some final quotes. So Brian Hill says that Lucy Mack Smith recalled his creativity, saying that in 1823, Joseph would occasionally give us some of the most amusing recitals that could be imagined. Pomeroy Tucker wrote that Joseph was an active reader of dime novels. Erasmus Turner remembered that Joseph helped solve some pretentious questions of moral or political ethics in our juvenile debating club and was a very passable exhorter at a Methodist camp meeting. So I think to your credit, you could interpret uh, some of these historical statements, him telling stories about the former ancient inhabitants of the Americas to his family, him participating in a debate club, being a Methodist exhorter, and perhaps reading dime novels, such as the, uh, the novels of Captain Kidd, prepared him to orally dictate a long narrative about the former ancient inhabitants of the Americas, and also to contain sermons and preaching. Brian Hale states in his article that everything Joseph would have orally dictated, he would have had to have absorbed in his mind, retaining it all in his memory. That he had been, critics often say that he had been memorizing the Bible, scrutinizing the view of the Hebrews, the late war, first book of Napoleon, and a whole bunch of other books, and that he'd been going to all kinds of camp meetings and religious revivals. The problem here is there is just no credible evidence to support that Joseph was doing any of these things. Well, I would actually push back. I think there's definitely strong evidence from Joseph Smith's own history, his own accounts, that he was reading the Bible quite deeply. He was probably quite familiar with it, and he was going to different revivals and going to the different denominations, I was very well acquainted with them. And if he was a passable exhorter, then you could say that he had some experience. But we've not got any specific evidence from people that he was going to libraries and purchasing and reading all of these books, such as like The Late War or The View of the Hebrews. Hill says that we also find that the midterm and short-term memory when you're dictating a book is highly taxed, highly burdened. So the memory is very much burdened throughout this process. Hales concludes Joseph Smith had no reputation as a preacher prior to dictating the Book of Mormon and no reputation as a storyteller. So as I apply the historical record to the model that I've created, I don't find a real convincing set of evidence that Joseph Smith would have been able to do this. The elephant in the room that nobody today has talked about is the difficulty of creative dictation. The ability that according to this theory, Joseph did, he was able to dictate all of these sentences in all their complexity without having to go back and do any content editing of any kind. And obviously there were some changes made in subsequent editions. Uh, we talked about that, some of the changes made to grammar or like Mary being the mother of God, the son of God or Mosiah to Benjamin. But for the most part, uh, there wasn't restructuring or modifications done to the Book of Mormon. Stephen Smoot uh, in a video by Book of Mormon Central says that these naturalistic explanations would be more persuasive if Joe Smith had worked alone, took a lot of time, had lots of resources and made a lot of revisions. And it is getting back to that if there's no notes, no manuscript, and he was just dictating this 588, uh, very long, complex narrative with his head in a hat uh, and doing it the way the, the scribes say that he did, that he would stop and then he would pick up from where he left off. That is a lot for Joseph to have in his head. Now, unless you would say he had a photographic memory, which there's no evidence that he did, but that could possibly explain how he could memorize and recite long passages of the Bible, how he could keep the narrative very coherent. That could explain, uh, you know, the Jaredite kings or all the geographical references. But certainly it is very difficult to orally, creatively dictate the Book of Mormon. Now, people might say that Joseph Smith always used dictation in his revelations and that maybe he was just gifted at doing this. Maybe. And this comes from Callister's book, uh, he, Hugh Nibley challenges his students to write a book comparable to the Book of Mormon. This is the way that he summarizes the challenge. Write a history of ancient Tibet covering a period of 600 BC to AD 450. Why ancient Tibet? Because you know no, you know no more about Tibet than Joseph or anyone else in the 1820s knew about ancient America. There's to be no research of any kind. It must be 531 pages, other than some grammatical corrections and a few other minor changes. You must make no modifications in the text. The first edition, as you dictated to your secretary, must stand forever. You must change your style of writing many times to represent various authors. Subsequent archaeological discoveries must support the truth of the objects, events, and names you refer to. You must invent 280 new names of people and places that will stand up under scrutiny through the years as to their proper application and derivation. Thousands of great men, intellectual giants, national and international personalities, and scholars must accept your history and its teachings as true. Tens of thousands of salespersons, i.e. missionaries, must give 18 months or more of their lives, paying their own expenses and bearing witness to the truth of the book. 
You must finish writing this book in around 65 working days. And Elder Callister says in his book, does anyone honestly expect us to believe that Joseph Smith, an unlearned young man of 23 years of age, searched out and studied all these resources on Native American life, inhaled the related conversations on this topic, ferried out the irrelevant, organized the remainder into an intricate story involving hundreds of characters, numerous locations, detailed war strategies, doctrinal gems, and then dictated with perfect recollection without any notes whatsoever, no outline, no manuscript, nothing, a fact acknowledged even among Joseph's critics. Well, critics would say he had a, an outline, had the story mapped in his head. During the entire translation process, no one remembers Joseph going to libraries, bring any such books home, or having any conversations concerning this research. Where, you might ask, is the corroborating evidence? It is nowhere to be found. And then he concludes with all the claims that Joseph Smith or someone else wrote the Book of Mormon. I have never seen anyone match it. Rather than spending an entire lifetime criticizing the Book of Mormon and arguing that Joseph wrote it, why don't the critics just find some brilliant person in his or her 20s who in 65 working days can write a comparable work? Of course, in order to be comparable, it must be done without a computer, any research assistance, and dictated without any notes in single draft. In the end, this would be the critics' best evidence that the Book of Mormon could be man-made. But as Anne, as B.H. Roberts challenged, just match it. But in the final analysis, this won't happen. Why? Because the Book of Mormon is matchless, it's a work of God, and therefore cannot be duplicated by man. Now, I know a critic would say, well, we shouldn't compare ourselves to Joseph Smith. He had this unique ability to orally dictate long text. He also has other scriptural productions like the Book of Moses, Book of Abraham, Revelations, but certainly the Book of Mormon is the longest oral dictation. As Davis put it, America's longest oral performance. Now, I would say that I don't think these arguments, this therefore proves the Book of Mormon, that it's beyond Joseph Smith's ability, because we can't know for certain what his abilities were. Certainly people around him, uh, his family members and friends, didn't think he was intelligent enough or gifted enough to do this. But I am tempted to try to take up this challenge, maybe not do it about Tibet, and I don't want to do something as long as the Book of Mormon, because quite frankly, that's going to take a lot of my time. But I've thought to myself about creating my own fictional story about people from Ireland, who are commanded by the Lord to migrate over to the promised land. And my promised land is Australia. Sorry, guys. Sorry, you Yanks. Australia is way cooler. And I want to include like different characters and plot lines and different geographies and have to include sermons and King James Bible passages and also try to include like Hebraisms and chiasmus and try to keep it all very cons consistent and coherent. And I know people will say, well, Murph, you're not, gonna, you're not as gifted or as talented as Joseph Smith. That was the oral culture, which is why I'm going to try to make it simpler and not as long as the Book of Mormon. But I think it will still be a good test because in many ways, would Joseph Smith be better prepared to orally dictate a 588 page narrative than myself? I'm a teacher. I'm a return missionary. I have had much experience giving talks, bearing testimony. I've also listened to many sermons, many conference talks. I've read through the standard works. I'm quite familiar with the language in there. And I would be better educated than Joseph. Sure, you could say my culture is more of a writing culture than oral culture. And I was also very creative in school at, at writing stories. So I'm considering doing a much shorter and simpler narrative. But then I like to have a go at orally composing it and just seeing how well my memory does and having sort of a rough outline. I'll maybe type up the outline, but I'm not allowed to refer to my notes when I do the dictation. So there won't be any written manuscript that I'm going to memorize, just a rough outline. I'm going to work on that maybe in the next year, take up the challenge. And again, these arguments doesn't prove that the Book of Mormon is ancient, is divine, is historical, but it just adds to the complexity of Joe Smith being able to produce this himself, do a creative oral dictation without notes manuscript, with his head in a hat. Whether or not he was looking at the spectacles or the seer stone, shows that he couldn't have been looking at other materials. And it does just stretch how good his memory would have had to have been, how difficult it would have been to keep everything coherent. And perhaps some of the 19th century elements or anachronisms critics point to can be more understood under a functional translation. So in summary, what have we covered in this video? There have been different theories given for the Book of Mormon, such as the Spalding Manuscript, view of the Hebrews and automatic writing. The main theory supports Joseph Smith's intellect and him orally dictating it from his milieu, borrowing from the King James Bible, Protestant sermons, the mind builder myth, his own father's dream, anti-Masonic rhetoric, you know, 
the late war. Vogel and Palmer, as well as LDS discussions, propose probably, in my view, the strongest naturalistic explanations. Apologists would say that they don't account for the ancient or complex elements that faithful scholars would point to, and perhaps the view of the translation being more loose or more of a functional translation, which might help to explain KJV and revivalist language. William Davis probably has the best theory for book moral composition, that similar to a Methodist preacher, Joe Smith laid down heads for each book or new piece of narrative. He would lay down a sketch outline similar to what Joseph did in his 1832 history, and then he would dictate uh, semi-extemporaneously. Gardner responds that Davis's only accounts for the historical narrative, but not the doctrine or sermons, and that it doesn't account for the memory he would have need, needed when it came to the geography or to the Jaredite kings, and that an outline isn't just a 19th century element or anachronism, because ancient authors could have also used this practice. Critics point to Joe Smith being creative with telling stories to his family members, participating in a debate club, Methodist exhorting, giving him the skills for creative dictation. There is a lack of evidence for Joseph other than reading the Bible and attending Protestant sermons, going to libraries and reading lots of books, and the burden it would have put in his memory in a creative dictation would have been quite severe without any notes or manuscript. So the faithful position would be that the naturalistic explanations, they try to account for material from the 19th century that Joe Smith might have been pulling from, but they struggle to explain exactly how Joseph could have done it. Alistair and Nibley invite people to match it, to try to produce a narrative comparable, and realize how naturally impossible it would be without notes or a manuscript to creatively dictate in two months. To my overall thoughts, I think there is some good naturalistic explanations for the Book of Mormon that are respectable. I don't find Solomon Spalding or the view of the Hebrews or even automatic writing uh, persuasive theories that this explains the Book of Mormon. Although automatic writing shows that Joe Smith isn't completely unique and there's other people who claimed to produce, you know, long text beyond their educational ability, um, claiming it came from some supernatural force. I do think that probably Vogel or Grant Palmer have probably the best naturalistic theory for the Book of Mormon. And then how Joe Smith composed it using more of William Davis's theory of laying down heads and then dictating semi-extemporaneously. And I'll probably explain more in my final episode where I come down on the naturalistic explanations. But I think the only issue I find with the naturalistic explanations is I feel like, you know, they account for the 19th century material, but then would ignore things which appear to me to be ancient or extremely complex beyond what most people could naturally do in an oral dictation. And they, you know, assume that Joseph Smith had the skills and abilities and that it's just a 19th century text. So I do think that there are some persuasive arguments and some very plausible theories, but I think there's also some counter explanations by apologists. And in the next episode, we're going to have a look at the translation theories. I did do a video early on, tight versus loose translation. However, that was more going back between apologists and critics. Whereas this, I'm going to go a little bit deeper and showing different uh, faithful views of the translation. So it's not going to be really looking at critics' responses to this, but the different approaches or theories that have been proposed for the Book of Mormon translation. And after that episode, it will be the final episode of this series, which will be my final analysis, summary, and conclusion on everything we've done and my final thoughts on the Book of Mormon, uh, which I'm really excited for. This has been a very long series, and I'm sure there'll be many more episodes where there's going to be more things that I'll be researching and interviewing people about with the Book of Mormon but we're coming near the end of the series. So if you enjoy this video, like, share, and subscribe. I'll see you next time for the next episode. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks everyone for watching this episode. If you've enjoyed it, please give it a like, share it with others who might benefit, and don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any future content. You can also listen to these episodes on podcast form on Anchor Spotify, and you can follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. Check out my website, for more content, personal blog, and more. And if you care to donate to support me, you can buy my PayPal or Patreon or through the website. And you can also give donations via YouTube through Super Chats. Thanks for watching Mormonism with the Murph. Take care. Bye-bye.